that we keep the, um, the, the meeting on schedule. So welcome tonight, good evening. This is the Millennium Park Community Meeting, and this is the second um, in a series of community meetings. My name is Allison Perlman. I work for the Boston Parks and Recreation Department, and I'm the project manager for um, Millennium Park, and I'm thrilled to be here with you all tonight. I want to acknowledge those who were able to come tonight. Thank you. I know that we all have so many meetings and jumping on another Zoom meeting is kind of the last thing I wanna do um, at the end of the day. But I know just from the previous meeting and all the emails and phone calls I've received um, that this park is so important to everybody in the neighborhood. Um, and so I'm, you know, I thank you for joining us tonight. I want to also uh, welcome any elected officials and staff. If we have anybody um, here, can you raise your hand? We have one. Hi, Peter. Do you want to say anything? Sure. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Favorito from City Councilor Matt O'Malley's office. Um, I'm his uh, West Roxbury community liaison. So I'm just here to take some notes and see how the meeting goes. I was, I was here at the last meeting. so. Excited to see how the second one goes. Great, thank you, Peter. Okay, so uh, before we jump into our presentation, I'd like to go over a few how-tos and what to expect. Next slide, great. Um, so the, the meeting is recorded. I wanna acknowledge the people that weren't able to attend tonight. Um, and so we are recording the meeting and we'll post to the project website within a week. Please share what you learned tonight and direct your neighbors, friends, and families to our website where they can view uh, this, this presentation when their schedule allows. And you can see the project website at the bottom of the slide there. Next slide. So tonight's meeting will be different from our past community meetings as circumstances have um, put most of our engagement activities online. As we are ever evolving in our online strategies, we heard uh, at the last meeting the desire to be able to see everyone in the meeting. So we've shifted to a Zoom meeting rather than a webinar. Um, this allows us to see you and you to see us. So hopefully this will feel a little more like an in-person engagement event um, until we get to that next step where we can meet in person. However, I want to acknowledge because the meeting is large enough, we really need to follow a few rules to make sure that the meeting goes smoothly. So first, during the presentation portion, we ask you to keep your microphone off. Um, it's up to you if you want to have your video on or off during this time. And you can also use nonverbal responses during the presentation. So as we're presenting, if there's something um, that you like or dislike, you can use a thumbs up or thumbs down. And those, uh, those reactions are at the bottom of the, the screen. You can click on the, the three dots and then you can be able to see the, the thumbs up and thumbs down reactions. In addition, I know that we're gonna be going through a lot of material tonight. So if there's things that pop up um, during the presentation, go ahead and just type in a comment or a question in the chat feature, which again, the, the um, chat icon is at the bottom of the, the screen there. Um, and then after the presentation, we're going to have a discussion time where you'll really have a chance to kind of ask questions and you can do that again through the chat feature. You can type in your questions, your comments, or you can use the raise hand feature, which is the, the hand sign um, icon at the bottom. You can raise your hand and then once we call on you, uh, we can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Also, if there's anybody joining us by phone, I don't see anybody. We don't have anyone by phone. No one by phone. Okay, perfect. Then we don't need to go over that piece of it. Great. So um, I just want to say thank you for your patience as we try these new ways to engage. And it's a little clunky because we're still getting used to it even after all this time. Um, but it, it is a, a really unique tool to be able to reach a lot of people um, that often aren't able to, to come to meetings. So it's, it's a great tool that we'll continue to use in some way as we move into the future. Next slide. We want to ensure the conversation feels accessible to everyone and each one of you feels comfortable sharing your questions and comments. So please be respectful and mindful of others' time so everyone has the opportunity to participate. Keep questions project specific and not personal to encourage conversation, which is solution driven. And once you've submitted or asked a question, please wait till others have an opportunity to ask questions before submitting another one. 
You can also set up a conversation with me at any time, but just please contact me through my email, which is um, allison.perlman at boston.gov, which again is at the bottom of the screen there. And I feel like many of you feel comfortable reaching out to me on email. So it's it's been great. You guys are um, able to access me that way too. So thank you. Hopefully that takes care of the housekeeping information. So um, next slide. Perfect. Oh, yep, there we go. So tonight I will introduce our project team and provide general project overview and discuss feedback that we've heard so far. Um, and then our design team will present site, site paving analysis, uh, real briefly, the, the restrooms, um, and then the three playground concepts to help generate discussion with you all during the question and answer discussion, uh, which will be after the presentation. And then we'll wrap up with um, next steps. So next slide. I'd like to acknowledge our exceptional team for the project. Uh, from the city, we are joined by Boston Park staff, Tom Timmons, who is the contract compliance manager for Millennium Park, and he works to ensure the park is safe and well cared for. In addition, we have Christine Brandeo, our outreach coordinator, who helps establish parks friends groups and is also the Zoom expert um, and one of our moderators tonight. And Jack Duggan, who I don't believe he was able to make it tonight. He had another meeting, but he's from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, and he really helps residents tap into city services and facilitate neighborhood concerns. So he was at our last meeting. Um, he's always available to chat with you as well. Great. And then, Glenn, do you want to introduce your team from CDM Smith? Sure. I'm uh, Glenn Howard, project manager. And we have four team members here tonight. Bob Button is our client service leader with uh, probably the most experience working at Millennium Park over the last 20 years. And then three of our design landscape architects, Nick Watkins, John Brunnenkant, and Rachel Gilfoyle will all be presenting um, throughout the, the, the evening. So thank you, Allison. Great, thanks. All right, next slide. So uh, Millennium Park was established in 2000 and it was formerly the Gardner Landfill. I think um, we heard from a lot of people who remember it as a landfill. It wasn't really that long ago. Um, and we took a landfill, a landfill and, and turned it into this amazing park that we see today. Because of its unique history, um, we acknowledge that it's, it's a little tricky to do renovations because of that land cap that's so important to, to keep protected. So um, as we move into the next renovation, uh, we're obviously thinking about that. But since 2000, we really, we've done some maintenance and some minor um, repairs, but we really haven't done any major capital construction, which means this kind of major design and construction period. Um, and so, you know, this is the first time to get in there and, and kind of start to think about some some things that really need to be taken care of. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that opportunity. After we finished design and construction, um, whether it was 2000 or then after we start our next project, maintenance kind of steps in between those gaps and they, they continue to do uh, maintenance and do outside contracts for line striping and that type of turf care. Um, and then also we're supported by 311, which is a great tool if you haven't used it. You can just use your phone and type 311 um, and access, uh, you can call and, and access people and be able to talk about your concerns, whether they're park related or city related, or you can use uh, the mobile app on your phone or use your desktop and access it that way. Next slide. So there's a lot of considerations guiding public park design, which includes the city of Austin priorities, such as expanding access and equity, resiliency and promoting health and community building. And then our own parks goals, which support the city's goals. And they include the creation of parks, which are accessible and available to all, provide diverse and balanced programming, promote meaningful and inclusive community engagement and create adaptive and resilient landscapes. And then also promote connection both physically within the neighborhoods, but then also between neighbors. And then on top of that, we also layer in the safety and regulatory guidelines like ADA and making sure that our playgrounds um, meet this, the, uh, the standards for safety play equipment. And then finally, community input. And it's certainly not least because 
You all certainly know this park better than we do. You're there all the time and you see what's happening and you know what's what's necessary for yourself and your neighbors. And so it's a really huge part of kind of laying the foundation. We start off listening to you and, and trying to understand and then making sure that we end up with this park design that um, the design team listens and then takes all of your ideas and creates a wonderful park that reflects, you know, what we heard from you and reflects the neighborhood itself. Um, next slide. Great. So for the Millennium Park project, our scope work includes improvements to the playground and pathways and restroom feasibility study. Specifically, the team reviews existing conditions and use identify new playground elements reflective of the community and translates this into a plan to upgrade the playground safety surfacing and access. The team will also assess feasibility of new restroom facility and replace and repair damaged pathways or parking areas, which will be on which will be an ongoing process. I want to acknowledge that I've heard from over 100 residents about the concern and need for an off leash dog recreation area in West Roxbury. Our current Millennium Park project funding is specifically earmarked for the playground pathways and restroom. The scope and budget was voted on and approved by the city council, so Boston Parks cannot reallocate this funding for another use such as a dog park. However, Boston Parks recognizes the need to provide space for all, and as such, we are working towards having a dog recreation area in every neighborhood. And as you may have heard, Councilor Arroyo is moving to advance this conversation forward with the City Council. In the meantime, Parks hears you. We have heard from families in the daycare facility about the pressing safety concerns of children and off-leash dogs, and we want to continue to work with residents, City Hall, State, and other agencies to find a solution, to find an area for a dog recreation park in uh, West Roxbury. But we also recognize the near term need to really be coordinating with animal control and community service officers in the park to make sure Millennium Park feels safe for everyone. Next slide. So this slide um, shows you the project schedule and for this particular renovation. And as you can see, we really have three community meetings to gather your feedback. We're here at the, the red box, which is the March 2021 community meeting number two. Um, and so that's why it's so important for us to really focus on the scope that we have and to hear from you on that specific scope because we have three meetings to hear all this information and to hear your feedback. And so we really wanna focus it on that. After we um, finish up this meeting, we're gonna present the three design alternatives based on what we heard from everybody. And then um, we're gonna go back, the design team will take all that feedback in again. Um, and then we'll come back to you in April, May to show you kind of the preferred design based on everything we heard and, and we, what we think um, is, a, is a great fit for Millennium Park. And that's when we come back and say, did we get it right? And to listen to you again. Um, and then from there, we move on to construction documents where we detail the design so contractors can bid the project for construction. And if all goes well, then we anticipate construction to start in fall of 2021 and reopen in summer, fall of 2022. Next slide. So in February, March, we received a lot of feedback uh, during our virtual meeting and emails and phone calls. And in general, we heard uh, how important this park is to so many people, um, the desire to create a fun and engaging space for all ages and abilities. We heard how so many use the pathway systems and the need to improve some areas and add furnishings along the way to continue a well-connected and accessible site. And we heard that a permanent restroom would be desired. Next slide. Specific to plantings of pathways, we heard the desire to add more native trees and benches to provide shaded seating areas and also improve habitat value. We heard the need for improvements to bicycle and pedestrian access from VFW Parkway to the park and the desire for bicycle racks at the park entrances. We also heard a desire for better connection from the lower fields to the play area, requests for exercise stations along the pathway system, and we heard about adding walking distances along the pathways too. So currently we have a kind of coded uh, pathway system, which you can see on the bottom left there. And we heard that maybe it would be helpful to have that translated a bit more on the paths themselves, so marking the distance um, as you go. Next slide. 
specific to restrooms. So um, early on when the, the park was constructed in 2000, this area here, which is next to the upper parking lot and the existing playground was kind of designated as a future restroom area, potential area. And that um, what they ended up doing was bringing up the utilities to this area so that we'd be ready to go if in the future we were able to build a restroom. But taking that in mind, um, we recognize that this space here is really important for the, or especially the organized, um, the athletics that are out there and that that's kind of a check in place. So taking into consideration that and knowing that we're going to have to think about that if we place a restroom facility there. But we also heard that permanent restrooms were important for extended activities, um, such as sporting events, but also for folks just walking along the pathways and for trips from the daycare. Um, where you spend kind of extended time periods at the park. And then we heard about the importance of maintenance and safety for any restroom facility. So it's important not only to build something, to have it accessible, but then to make sure that people feel safe to use it and that it's clean. Next slide. And then specific to the playground, um, I just want to give a shout out to the Boy and Girl Scout troops of West Roxbury. They have been amazing at providing feedback. And um, hopefully some of you were able to join us tonight and I can't wait to hear more feedback from you. We also heard um, a lot of feedback from the public and families uh, about the playground as well. So we heard that swings are important, especially a mix of different types, such as traditional or dish. We heard the desire for additional features, such as climbing features, um, rope structures, handholds zip line slides whether it's a big one or side by side or embankment but we heard metal was they didn't want metal because it's too hot um, we heard the the desire for a playhouse for structures with bridges things that spin a seesaw um, we heard a request for features that use elements like wind or bird watching and then we heard ideas for nature themed play and creative elements um, we heard from girl scout troop 79238, uh, specifically requesting a treehouse element, and they provided a sketch, which was awesome. And um, Cub Scouts also suggested a wetland or a pollinator theme. We heard a need for more seating within the play areas, and we heard a lot about play space enclosures. So some noted fencing should be considered for safety of the small children. Um, others noted fencing each area off like it is now is sometimes challenging for parents with multiple children of different ages and how to access and, and you know um, supervise was challenging. And then we heard finally that maybe we should consider a mix or other natural barriers, especially for the older children's play area. And then just a couple other ideas. Um, People said maybe we should think about recycled elements because um, it's a landfill and that we should replace the wood chips. So um, those are all really great feedback. We heard from a lot of people, which is really exciting because this is such a big park. It serves so many people. So it was great to get so much feedback. So hopefully you'll see all this feedback and how it kind of um, plays out in the design concepts that the design team will present tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to CDM Smith. I think it goes to Glenn. Yes, thank you, Allison. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I, I first want to just mention that um, we really appreciate all the feedback that we uh, got at community meeting number one and all of the emails that we received after. It was very helpful in developing the uh, conceptual designs. I think we've come up with some, some pretty creative ideas and a lot of that is uh, due to the comments that we received from you. So thank you uh, very much. Um, I mentioned we do have three presenters with three different concepts. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, next slide, please. I do just want to mention, you know, another big part of this project that I mentioned um, at community meeting number one was that we are looking at all the pathways and the parking lots and roadways for, you know, looking at the condition that we're going to be doing some repaving work as part of this project. So um, I mentioned that we had walked during last fall, we walked the entire site. Um, every foot of the pathways and, and roadways. And this plan is something that we produce for the parks department. It has quite a bit of detail to it, pretty much identifying where the cracks are, what the condition of the pavement is, um, whether we think that the pavement will have to be completely replaced or whether it can just um, be fixed with, you know, crack repair or just an overlay. Uh, next slide. This is just some of what we saw. Um, 
the upper left picture is pretty um, representative of like the upper pathway and the mid-level pathway. The, the pathways are in pretty good condition, but there are, uh, this was an old landfill, so there is some settlement. So every 50 feet or so you end up with pretty consistent cracking. So we're gonna have to look at what we can do with that. Um, the lower, the lower left picture is all along the backside, which is the pathway that is right along the wetlands. And you've got a lot of tree roots that have grown underneath the pathway. And there's a lot of water underneath from the wetlands and that come down from the landfill. So that's caused some more damage on the lower pathway. Um, the upper right picture is the roadway to the canoe launch. Similar situation where you had a lot of water coming down from the landfill over the years. And we've seen some more significant damage on that roadway. And then the uh, lower right picture is just typical, you know, 20 years later in parking areas, the kind of conditions that we're seeing with some, some cracking and, and chipping of the pavement. Next slide, please. So for the purpose of this meeting, I really just wanted to quickly um, show the results of our analysis. What you see in green, we found the condition of the, the green pathways to be pretty good, um, probably just need some crack repair. Everything in yellow divided between the parking areas and the pathways. Um, the yellow pathways are, we're calling it moderate condition. They're going to they're need some work, mainly with the cracking I talked about, and they may need a pavement overlay. We're trying to figure that out now as we go into the design. Um, for the construction documents, we'll be defining exactly what needs to happen. Parking areas are in a little worse shape, as you would expect from, from vehicle traffic. Um, so same thing, moderate to poor condition of the parking areas and the entrance roadways. And then what you see in red, that's what I showed in the picture. Those are the worst conditions, the roadway going down to the canoe launch. Uh, we consider that poor condition and, and a lot of the red at the top of the picture here, um, also very poor from the water and the, the tree roots. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're gonna have three presentations. And before I um, pass it on to our presenters, um, you know, I would like everybody to think about as we look at each concept, We'll talk a little bit about um, specific play features, but really think about the areas. We've divided these into um, area A through D with each concept. Um, think about how the kids are going to move between these areas. And you know, for the parents on the on the um, meeting here, you know, how you will supervise the kids. Areas will you feel comfortable sitting and watching, and and kind of feel comfortable. You'll be able to get a good view of kids as they move back and forth from from different play areas. Um, think about how the, the areas that we're showing are laid out for kids of different ages um, and whether some areas should be completely fenced um, or whether natural materials like landscaping we're showing here and some, some earth berms, if that might be um, suitable rather than you know fencing uh, the areas in like they are now. I, I know one concept you're gonna see this, actually this concept has a slide going to the bottom of the hill. So think about if you're at the top um, and your kids are sliding down to the bottom near field one, it, it's, there's quite an elevation difference. You're quite, quite a ways away. So you know, what's your comfort level gonna be um, when it comes to feeling like you can supervise the kids going up and down the hill and how comfortable are you gonna be going up and down the hill? So just some general overall things to think about. Um, think about how you would move through and how, the, how each space relates to each other. Um, and I think uh, the presenters will pick up on that a little bit more as they go through each one. So with that, um, one um, Zoom call um, thing I mentioned last meeting there, over to the right of the pictures, there's the little double white lines. You can click on those and you can um, enlarge your screen and en enlarge the presentation and, and reduce the presentation as you need if you, you wanna see something a little closer. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Bronenkant for our concept number one presentation. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but can I just um, mention, don't forget everyone, um, as you're following along, there's a lot of information here. So if something pops up in your mind, if you want to comment or question, just add it to the chat so that we can make sure to keep track of all that. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so my name is John Browningkant and I am gonna go over the first concept. Um, so the theme for this concept was uh, the birdhouse, a view of the city. This theme came from the diverse populations of birds on Millennium Park and also the amazing views you get from the top of Millennium Park. The design focuses on being a more compact design um, with the hillside being incorporated into the playground area. 
Um, using these themes of birds, we can add structures like nests, perches, and even a three-tiered bird structure, birdhouse structure that will connect the lower and upper areas of the playground uh, with the use of a slide and a climbing wall. Um, we also provide granite seating around um, all these different areas to kind of uh, encapsulate each different area, create some buffers, and also provide some seating for the parents, guardians, and children. Um, so now I'll dive into each individual area. So if you would advance the slide one, please. So the first area is um, area A, and this area is geared for the two to five-year-olds. Um, this area is fully enclosed with an ornamental fence. Um, the idea with this is because there's such young children, we'll want to keep them enclosed and um, provide a little additional sense of security for the parents. Um, inside this area, we'll have a birdhouse play structure. Uh, the structure will have um, lookouts, slides, and some climbing and other activity features within it. Um, there will also be other uh, climbing features and um, nests within this area for the kids to play in. Um, one of the main features in this is a bench that's incorporated into the fencing so that parents can still be within the same area as their children, but be able to relax and kind of sit down and still have an eye on all of their children in the area. Um, will you go to the next slide, please? So area B is kind of more of a large open play area. Um, the idea with this was swings and balancing. Um, so we were hoping to incorporate um, log bridges and other balancing equipment along with some swings that were kind of over to the side in their own uh, area so that people running through this playground area don't have to interact with ki other kids swinging and um, dealing with the issues of, of getting hit or something. Um, so this area is a large open programmable area that we can put any type of equipment that um, the community thinks is best for this area. Um, we put balancing and sw swings in this area, but really anything could go here. Um, some of the main features along this are a berm along the backside to help enclose this area a little bit more, along with some granite um, seating walls that uh, wrap around a portion of this area. There's also a hardscaped picnic area for the parents and kids to gather and have lunch or whatever they need to do um, while still being in the playground area. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, the area C is the large five to 12 year old area. And um, this area utilizes the hillside in the play area by connecting to it with an embankment slide and also a climbing scramble hill. And the idea with this is that you can um, climb up this birdhouse structure um, that kind of takes the vernacular of a treehouse and also a birdhouse. And um, it's this three-tiered structure that kids can climb up and climb ropes and bridges and then slide all the way down the embankment slide to the bottom portion. Then they can climb up the scramble wall to complete their circuit. Um, we will incorporate some seating at the top and bottom of this area for parents to be able to watch their kids because there is the whole issue of um, this being a slope and um, at, when you're on the top, your views may be obstructed of the bottom and vice versa if you're on the bottom. Um, you can advance the slide. And this final area, area D, focuses on a large rope structure for the kids to climb up and get a great view of the city. Um, the other idea we had with this was to paint the rubberized surfacing underneath this uh, structure with uh, the symbol of a compass so that kids and everyone else could orient themselves in the area and better understand the, the region. Um, we wanted to have some amphitheater granite seating along one edge of it so that kids could sit and relax while their other friends are playing or for parents to relax there. We also try to preserve the um, slope going down the hill so that kids could still slide down the hill during the winter. Um, we didn't put any, propose any plantings or anything so that kids have free access to slide down the hill. Um, and this wraps up my uh, concept of the first concept. So I will 
um, invite Allison to uh, talk about any comments that we have. Yeah, I didn't, there wasn't, um, there's not a lot added to the chat, but I did see the physical thumbs up um, on, I think on the, the climbing structure and keeping the sledding held. So thank you. Um, so, so let's move into concept two. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rachel Guilfoyle. Um, I'll be going over the second concept. Uh, so similar to John, I was inspired by the birds um, at Millennium Park. Um, so this concept is uh, the birds and their habitat. So this is really a, a nature themed playground, both in theme and also in form and texture. So you'll see that the, the spaces have like a soft natural shape to them and planted spaces are woven in and out of the play spaces. So this kind of creates an open flow to the playground, allowing children to move naturally from one area to the next. But it also creates a sense of discovery when the kids like find a new play area. Um, and the, the planted areas also act as natural buffer, both um, visually and, and physically from um, you know, the parking lot and the walkway. So you'll see multiple um, smaller picnic areas with a couple of tables are included in the playground. Um, they're just weaved in throughout the play space, allowing parents and families a uh, place to sit and rest while the kids are, well, they're still, you know, inside of the playground. Um, these also provide a good vantage point for caregivers to watch their children as they play. So next slide, if we look at area A, this is the tot lot area of the playground. So this is um, all the way to the north back from the parking lot. So um, I didn't include any fences here, um, just uh, some natural buffers, um, but like I said, far, further away from the parking lot, which is um, a concern. Uh, so it's it's not physically fenced off from the rest of the space, but it is quieter, um, slower paced area for younger children and their parents. It's away from you know the fast moving, um, running older kids. So this space focuses on theme play with um, a few woodland village playhouses, as well as an area for um, this fun custom bird's nest play structure that would be great for imaginative play. Um, and it's obviously very on theme. <laughs> I'm proposing creating a small play mound here to the south um, off of the walkway. So this would be about four or five feet tall and we could get a lot of um, great play value in here. So we could include a double embankment slide, which is great for the younger children. It's great to, for kids to um, slide down with a friend and race each other. And it's great for a caregiver to join a child um, down the slide. <clears throat> we can also include various climbing features here, such as handholds and, and ropes. And um, we can get really creative with that. That would provide um, you know, multiple opportunities for children to climb up the mound and then get back down. So we can put benches in this area for parents, but also um, you can see there's boulders um, along the um, like planted buffers. Um, these as well as the mound itself are, are great for parents to sit and rest and watch your children play. So next slide. Areas B is what, is what I'm referring to as the, the wetland. So this space is made up of various timber form balancing equipment with net climbers in between them. So this acts as sort of an obstacle course, um, which would allow children to you know, race through it or create games and challenges, you know, be able to choose the route um, so they could choose you know, varying difficulty. Um, also in this area, I've included uh, multiple um, spinning pieces of spinning equipment. Uh, kids of all ages and abilities you know, love this type of play. Um, and it's a great opportunity for multiple children and caregivers as well to play on the same piece of equipment at once. So you can see on the left, um, those two spinner equipment pieces. Um, you'll see at the bottom, there's one of the picnic areas here to the south. Um, again, this um, is a smaller picnic area for families and um, with boulders as well for um, extra seating on the side. Uh, next slide. So area C includes the main attraction of the playground. So I'm, I'm calling this the treetop climber and it will uh, include a large rope climbing structure. Um, you know, it will be an instant magnet for children. As soon as they see it, they're gonna want to um, climb to the top. And these also hold a really high capacity of kids at the same time. Um, and since Millennium is such a 
um, popular, heavily used park. Um, something like this would be great. Um, there are various, in the, um, you can customize these a lot. So you can create different routes to get to the top um, to these crow's nests. So um, I was thinking we could customize these. Um, on the bottom left, you'll see a, a bird's nest um, type lookout. The top right, there's more of like a treetop, um, like bird house type structure. We could get really creative here. Um, and, and you know, the older kids will immediately see these and want to climb to the top. We get that vantage point above their parents. Um, but also younger children or children with different abilities will be able to interact with this structure since there are many different ways to customize a climbing net um, to include different play opportunities that are at more ground level. We could also include, um, you know, large rope bridges like I'm showing now um, that leads to this giant slide. And then next slide. So finally, area D um, would include a timber frame zip line and a swinging area. So zip lines are always a hit in playgrounds. It's one of those things that kids of all ages just want to go again and again and again, um, thinking flying through the air like a bird. <laughs> um, then also the, the swing sets will include toddler swings as well as these nest swings, which are um, inclusive and they allow multiple children to share and play at once. Um, so that brings us to the end of concept two. Great. So thank you, Rachel. Um, I did hear there's a couple questions and we're going to hold the questions to the very end. Um, but I did, I'll just say a couple comments that we heard. Um, a bunch of them came in at the last minute. So I'm looking through this. I heard um, that people were loving the bird themes, um, love the timber frame zip line. Uh, and then there's a lot of questions about oh, this. This looks like a really exciting uh, playground from Emily. So that's great. And there's a bunch of questions that I think we will will hit on at the end of the presentation. So let's go into concept three. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Watkins, and I'm going to take you through concept C. So Millennium Park is a really unique site in the greater Boston area, and it sits at an elevation that provides some pretty amazing views of the surrounding natural environment with the wetlands and the river habitats below it, uh, as well as the Boston city skyline further out. So the site really reminds me of the experience of hiking in New England and making it to the top of a bald faced mountain or a rock outcropping and getting these amazing rewarding views of the surrounding landscape. So concept C is themed after the urban wild and it attempts to accentuate this wilderness feeling generated uh, by the playground surroundings. Um, and it does that by creating an elevated rocky outcrop mountaintop uh, quote unquote mountaintop at the south of the play area. And this descends down to a valley floor in the center of the play area through a hardwood forest to the west of the play area and down to a lower wetland riverbank. So the key intervention to the existing site that allows for this experience is a series of berms and mounds that raises the elevations of what is a relatively flat site. Uh, and this provides a, a heightened overlook area as well as areas that um, give you a, a greater sense of enclosure. So the site is currently very exposed and providing some sheltered areas would really help on windy, cooler days. So the main bermed areas run along the entire southern edge of the playground along that southern pathway. They wrap around the eastern edge and there's also one that runs through the center of the site. And that provides some of that separation of spaces uh, and a little bit of enclosure to our separate areas. So if we go to the next slide, please, we'll start uh, at the bottom with area A. Uh, this is the two to five play area and it's themed after the Charles River wetland ecosystem that sits at the base of Millennium Park. Uh, the play elements are arranged in a, in a rough loop formation and they're themed after river creatures and habitats. Um, some of the ideas here are having an interactive beaver structure that is um, pulling on some uh, down beaver chew balancing logs that can be climbed over or run through or hidden behind. There's a bouncing canoe that sits in the water surrounded by some other river creatures. Um, 
one element that could be included throughout the site is a series of woodland wetland creatures that could be mounted throughout uh, the different areas of the site. And this would kind of create a fun interactive scavenger hunt game and uh, kind of accentuate the theme of each of the ecosystem areas. Uh, so for the wetland area, uh, some of the possibilities would be turtles, ducks, fish, uh, and other interactive elements. Um, some seeded spinners are situated in the water as well. Um, and at the park entrance, a focal beaver lodge playhouse would allow for a little bit of climbing uh, within the structure or over. Um, and you can go down a uh, possibility of an embankment slide integrated into the structure. Uh, the structure also serves to block the main entrance to the park and reduce the desire to run out into the parking area. Um, a pole forest with river reeds adds a little bit of verticality to the space. Uh, gives you ability to attach low climbing balancing elements throughout uh, and this all culminates in a basket swing with some fantastic views out of the park. Uh, we could move to the next slide please. Uh, so as you move up to area B, uh, this is the central play area. Uh, you'll notice that the, the bermed mound kind of wraps around the, uh, what, the, the bottom of the page, which is the eastern uh, side of the park. And it provides a, a planted buffer from the parking area and the main entry to the play space and also helps to kind of create that sense of enclosure. So there's also another central planted berm that further encloses the space and kind of serves to separate the two to five and the five to 12 area and still allowing a little bit of fluidity of motion, a little bit of overlap between uh, some of the all age pieces of equipment. So um, in, in this area, the, there's an implied east-west linear motion throughout the um, 5 to 12 space, and it really lends itself well to a long sequence of equipment. One possibility would be uh, a balance and agility uh, adventure um, piece of equipment, an array. Um, this could be customized, interacted with in an infinite amount of ways. Um, but what that will do is it will draw kids across the park to elements on the western or the eastern side, depending on what side they uh, are playing on at the time. Um, on the eastern edge, you have the ability to provide, for example, a swing set, uh, an ADA carousel, and these could easily be used by kids crossing over from the two to five play area, as well as kids in the five to 12 area. So that's a little bit of that fluidity of motion and um, being able to kind of branch out of the, the specific areas. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So area C, you'll notice that the pathway at the southern edge of the playground um, has been raised. I know it's a little difficult to see in this slide, um, but if you imagine that that upper path area being five feet, the gray area being five feet above the brown area, um, it, what we've done is we've created a rocky berm along the entire southern edge. And this contains that entire lower play area that we've been discussing, and it provides an elevated play space with views across the playground above uh, along that gray path, uh, also views to the scenery beyond. So we've envisioned that this berm could be planted with evergreens, uh, some pine shrubs, kind of appear as though it's a natural Massachusetts rocky outcropping. Uh, and in this concept, the, the high point is centered around a wooden lookout tower play structure. Um, it's modeled off of historic fire towers that still exist in Massachusetts today. I think there were 110 of them. Um, the structure could be accessible from the elevated southern pathway, um, as well as from a staircase trap door, which you could access from the lower playground below. The interior of the tower could be a playhouse similar to the Beaver Lodge structure in the, in the two to five area. Uh, and a wraparound deck could provide you uh, access to some view, viewing binoculars, um, and also the possibility of a double racing slide to the lower play areas B and D. So if we go to the next slide, area D is kind of seen as an, an optional add-on area to extend area C to the western edge of the site. Um, existing condition is, uh, there's an existing stand of some fairly mature trees and it provides a fantastic start to a more shaded hardwood forest area. So this location would be excellent for another whimsical, imaginative focal structure, possibly forest themed, uh, with the ability to climb under, over, up to another playhouse space, and possibly another uh, maybe winding slide to give you a little bit of variation. Surrounding this area um, are other proposed uh, forest themed pieces of equipment, um, such as seating or uh, hanging mushroom spinners, and the possibility of a timber seesaw. 
Um, and as far as seating for, if we could go back to the main slide. Um, thank you. So as far as seating for caregivers and children, um, there are excellent locations throughout the site for bench seating uh, that would provide good views across all the play areas, uh, including at all of the entry points. I know that those are points that um, wanna be closely watched. There's also a great opportunity pro to provide some picnic seating um, at the center north portion of the site. This will take advantage of some of the views across the play space, as well as towards the fantastic scenery that we have the ability to take advantage of here. And uh, that summarizes concept C, thank you. Great, so just really quickly, I'll go over a couple quick comments. It seems like um, overall, a lot of people really like the nature-based ideas. We got that from you all um, and took it back and the, the design team ran with it, which was great because um, they did a great a great job of coming up with some really creative ideas. Um, so I have uh, just, just you guys must have so much fun creating these designs. Kudos to bringing inventiveness and excitement and unusual structures to the playgrounds, especially like the wooden and rope structures and nature based designs. And that came from Ben. And then we have from Bridget agree regarding nature based design and natural materials for play. One question is on slides. Is there another material? Um, maybe not plastic, maybe not metal what else could there be and we can get to that um and then yeah there's a lot of of this looks this blends in well with the environment um and then there was a couple um oh and, and a few people noted that, that they really like the river edge uh theme as well the two to five play area so um, I think that we, maybe we can turn this over to the question and answer period. Um, and we can, John, are you gonna be running the, that section? Oh, sorry. sorry, we have one more thing. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Allison. Yeah, we, we did, okay. I just wanted to, you know, all of the uh, concepts, um, have differing separation between the play areas. And again, um, thinking about safety, um, there is gonna be a survey um, after this that everyone will have access to and it's gonna have each of the concepts with all of the pictures and, um, and the description. So you'll be able to see that again and take your time and look at each, each concept in each area um, and some of the equipment. Um, but again, I ask you as you do that, kind of think again about safety for kids and, you know, we do want to stay as natural as possible you know if if we can use landscaping and the and the earth berms the four four foot high type berms um will that be enough separation to for you to be comfortable um with the, you know with, with your ability to, to supervise the kids or um you know where where do we really need to have um actual fencing so um that's one thing i just wanted to to highlight before we move on to questions and then ultimately move into the survey so thank you I think we can go to the next slide. Again, this is just an overview of all three concepts. So um, I think we can take questions. Yeah, we got some great questions. So um, one of the first questions was, uh, will there be any lighting design for this playground? You know, um, I can take that, that one. Um, this park is closed. It's kind of the, the hours are dust till dawn. Um, so, or, so we don't really have a lot of lighting because it's, it's closed, uh, when it is dark. So we don't have any plans for lighting at the moment. Great. Sorry, said had her hand held for a little while, so I might unmute her. You're still on mute, Terry. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take too long because I could go on and on about you know, equity and the things that you mentioned in the beginning and inclusiveness. And that goes for people who are homeowners who have dogs. But I'm not going to go on sidetrack onto that because it sounds like you had that previously. Um, that's something I'll probably take up with the city council because um, I don't see a space for people who have family members who happen to be dogs. But I did want to also ask you about, you had mentioned in the beginning when you were speaking, Allison, about um, an exercise area. 
Like for example, I grew up in West Roxbury and then I lived in Cambridge for 30 years. At the end of my street in Cambridge over by the BU Bridge, there's an exercise area um, that my son used to use a lot. And um, I, one thing I realized when I was Googling trying to find a similar thing is Boston doesn't have anything comparable. And I'm wondering, since you're doing all this renovation and you did in the beginning of this discussion, mention something about an exercise area. Were you exclusively talking about exercise area for children? Or are you thinking that there could be an exercise space for young adults, adults, people? Um, the magazine park that's right over by the BU that bridge that has all that exercise equipment or are you in, planning on including any of that in there or is this just a children's play space that we're talking about? Yeah, so um, I can answer that. We we focus on the play space because we needed a lot of input on that um, in terms of what kids would like to see, what parents and caretakers would like to see. But yes, the pathways are a big part of this. Um, and part of the reason why we don't talk about it a lot is just because there's like, we have to repair the damaged areas of the pathways. But we heard from a lot of people how they wanted exercise stations along the pathways and then the distant markings. And so we're gonna be looking at that as we um, progress with the areas of the pathway, pathways that we'll be repairing. We're gonna be thinking about how we can add exercise stations along the areas where appropriate. Um, or, or even one exercise station, like they have at, at Magazine Beach, you know, like yeah. one area where people can actually work out. I mean. When I was Googling it, the only thing I found was a pull-up bar at JP at the Jamaica Pond. Because I, I moved back to West Roxbury after having grown up here. Um, and so I've only been, we've been here for about two and a half years, having lived in Cambridge for 30 years. But, um, and growing up here to like 20. But, um, you know, I think that, I think that the bike paths, all of this stuff was done in Cambridge so long ago. And I think that it's great to have a good space for kids um, and, you know, having a nature themed area, but also like at Fresh Pond, you know, Ranger Jean over at Fresh Pond gives like nature tours and talks to the kids actually about nature and looks at plants and things like that. So there's other ways than just, you know, the, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, um, like the bird thing, you know, you can go see real birds. I mean, there's an owl that lives on that lower path um, down by the water. Um, there's a lot of nature there. Terry, are you offering to volunteer some tours for children? I'm just kidding. I'm I'm, kidding. Unfortunately, I'm working quite a bit. You know, the <laughs> mental health field, I work in the mental health field and we are booming and we have a wait list at the clinic. Yes. So I, I have no time. So I, um, I, I totally hear you that our kids are, you know, often programmed and we, we send them off and say, go play with this play structure or whatever. And there needs to be more plative a creative play and exploration and Millennium Park is such a great place to do that. It is. Unfor unfortunately, we don't have that many programs out there. We do have some programs. We, there's an urban wild um, as part of this park. And so we work with them to do some more um, kayak expeditions and, and exploration. Um, but you're right, you know, adding more kids programming with with programs with um, environmental education is such a great idea and it really involves kind of partnerships with community organizations and volunteers to help kind of promote those kind of programs because our staff right now is is pretty bare bones in terms of the, our ability to do that but i definitely will take that um back to our our outreach and external affairs and and make sure they hear that that comment well, i i think over at fresh pond i think ranger jean works for the park service i'm not sure she gets paid so she's a paid, I think she's the only one, but she's a paid employee and she's developed yeah. a, curric a curriculum. But um, I'm not gonna take up too much time with the whole dog thing. That's why I joined you because, um, you know, uh, having moved here in Cambridge, there, there are so many parks that have shared use time from nine to 11, you can bring your dog or from five to eight or whatever. I mean, they, they've developed like a number of different strategies to accommodate all the citizens within the area. And I just don't see that. And, and it, it could really decrease the disharmony that happens between people who are all sharing the space. So, um, but I'll talk about that in a different avenue. I think somebody mentioned that there's a city councilor, Rayho. Is that what somebody said? Um, uh, councilor, councilor Rayho. And um, yes, they, it's, you know, I think it's a pressing issue everyone 
everyone acknowledges that uh, dog recreation space is important in particular people in West Roxbury have raised that concern. So it's really, I think they've done an excellent job um, elevating that issue. And I think that you're gonna start seeing that more and more come up, so. Well, I mean, yeah, it's great. We have the Blue Hills, we can go there and, and it's great to have access to the Blue Hills, but it's just like a no brainer. It's the same as the bike paths. There are some, some things that being urban dwellers, you know, we pay taxes. Um, my, uh, you know, kids no longer in school. So, you know, I have my, my animals and um, it would be nice to have a place to bring them to, uh, you know, she's old now, so she doesn't have any problems with other dogs, but it would be a nice place to have a designated area. This is where you can bring your dog everybody's allowed or here's small dogs or large dogs or whatever is decided yes. down the road but very right. nice designs i don't want to take too much time very nice designs thank you terry sure glenn would you like to talk about the existing workout area that's at the site as well sure I, we did 20 years ago there is a small workout station just off one of the parking areas um, with a couple pieces of equipment and you know, we have discussed during this project either possibly replacing that equipment or adding a couple of other small workout stations along the pathways. That's that's something we have been been discussing. But there is there is there is a current small workout station um, just off the edge of the the lower parking lot. So, but again, that went in twenty years ago. So that is something that we definitely would want to look at um, updating. So James has his hand up. Oh, sorry, John. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll just go with one question. So one one question we have are that there's a concern about the birdhouse structures. Will they look drab in a couple of years? Um, like will the materials kind of break down because it's a, a timber-based structure? Yeah, I can take that, and maybe Nick um, can answer a little bit. But everything that we have we're showing on all these concepts none of this is prefabricated it's all it all comes from leading manufacturers so it's gone through rigorous testing as meeting stm standards and um you know we, we get information from them for uh rel related to safety and and what we're going to need to do beneath each of the structures so um you know these as the de as we get into our preferred design um depending on what options you know we hear back from you in the survey and and what we're hearing tonight um, if those types of structures are what we're looking at, there are there's multiple options for multiple manufacturers. So that is something we will definitely be um, looking into as far as durability, um, get some information from the manufacturers on, you know, elements that have been installed for several years and, and what the condition is. And we'll do our best to look at some of those examples too. Yeah, and I can add on to that real quick, Glenn. Um, so uh, a lot of the timbers that are used when you're using a, doing a natural timber um, system, it would be a, a black locust or a very hard, dense hardwood like that, that um, it resists rot and it also resists splinters. I know that's a big concern um, for people when you're putting in some timber elements. So um, these things are there, you know, it looks like it's just a timber, but there's a lot of attention paid to preparing it so that it lasts for a long time. It's not gonna rot and break down and it's not gonna injure anyone. James, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hello? Hi, James, go ahead. Hi, um, I didn't attend the last meeting, but uh, I was wondering what the uh, status of the West Roxbury High School campus is like, and I was wondering if there was anything uh, addressing the linkage between the two. They have uh, tennis courts and a very nice running track, which could be utilized by the park users. So I guess what is the what is the status of that land? And then one other, other comment is, um, I love the idea of the amphitheater. And I was wondering if they could expand a little more on enlarging that for potentially performance areas such as music or you know, anything. Uh, so it's more active uh, kinetically or instead of being just a place to sit. And I'm, um, I'm with Terry about the uh, exercise area as well as the, um, you know, stretching it out because they, 
I do like all of the playgrounds, but it just seems like you're compartmentalizing the, the area. And I wish you could sort of stretch out, you know, there'd be more interaction between the, the other people using the park as well as the wetlands next door. So that's, that's a number of questions, but beginning with the linkage of the high school, any, any possibility of using their facilities and uh, enlarging the amphitheater. Yeah, so I can take the, um, or I can maybe not answer your question, but the, I don't know the status of the, the West Roxbury um, High property and, and what's gonna happen with that. I think they're still trying to kind of figure that out. Um, but I, you know, I wonder if Glenn or Bob can speak to kind of connections from the the um, the artificial turf fields down there up to the playground because I'm not as familiar. There's a lot of slope there, and so I'm not familiar um, what that connection is. Yeah. So when we re we also worked on that project, we redeveloped the West Roxbury Education Complex field. There's um, as you come in, you see the bus stop and the backstop of the baseball field. There's a pathway system that comes right up through the center between the fields um, and connects in. There, there are pathway connections up to the park. There's a connection to the lower um, pathway that goes around the backside of Millennium. And then there's a connection to the main walkway that follows the driveway up into the parking lots. So yeah, there is elevation change, but there um, there's multiple pathway connections. So, so are you saying they're existing now? They're existing pathways. I, I wasn't aware that the that the track and field were not accessible. No, from there's the a park. you you cannot walk at least the the pathway I was on directly to say the field the soccer field or football field with the tr surrounding track. Um, I didn't. I never saw any kind of convenient linkage between the two. What I would suggest potentially looking at is an actual gate. And I know there's grade changes. I think there's um, some sort of gully there with stone, which would require some sort of footbridge. But I mean, it just seems to be an opportunity that we're, it could be easier access and it's something they can close if they wanted to. But um, from, I've been there many times and I've never really found a convenient area to um, walk across. So maybe yeah, I just not a direct right connection, up. not a direct connection from the middle, but uh, if you're familiar, the parking lot that's up at the top of the hill where the, there's the monument, that there's the West, Rib, West Roxbury education. Um, we put a monument in right at the top of the hill. That okay. pathway comes down and it parallels um, the athletic fields and it does head down towards where the main entrance is for the whole park. That, that's really the connection. So you do have to go out and around. When we right. did the original design 20 years ago, we had an actual wooden staircase that went up. Um, and at some point, um, Bob may know if he's, um, but I think s several years ago, they took that out. Um, I'm guessing it was just, it ended up in poor condition or when we redid the, we had to redo that, that whole area had to be capped because it was also part of the landfill. So yeah, I can that, touch on that yeah. a little. I can touch on that a little, Glenn. Um, one of the things that you'll see with the fields at the high school is they are fenced off because they're synthetic turf. So we've deliberately done that to protect them from damage. But there are pathway connections between the two sites. And although the high school is closed, the, the, the jogging track and the, and the fields themselves are open and are actually part of the Millennium Park site. So I, I think... Uh, you know, we'll try to improve as part of the pathway project, some of the signage and linkage of the pathways, but they are actually all connected to one another and available for use. I believe the parks department controls the use of the fields through the permitting process, but in fact, they are open and part of the site itself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. We do um, control the permitting and the maintenance of those fields, but I, um, I think it does, it's, it's come up with, you know, I've seen a lot of chat in here about like those connections and they could be better kept. So I think it's worth maybe us kind of revisiting that con those connections and taking a look at those as part of the pathway project too. So thanks for bringing that to our attention, everyone. All right, John, do you wanna go through some of these other comments? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is probably a question for Glenn. Um, it is, uh, how will you adapt these concepts and parks for those who need physical accommodations? 
so as each uh, designer developed the concepts and you know each one of you may want to speak up on specific elements but um, all the areas are accessible and there are actual I, I saw you know there are actual components that are designed specifically for um, uh, people with with disabilities and uh, I know Nick I think you're you, you had pointed out one and and Rachel you may have also but do you, any, you guys want to talk specific design elements? Yeah, um, and and I think maybe Rachel could speak a little bit to this as well. But um, I, I know that when we're talking about I inclusive play, um, there's there's a distinction between people being able to use every piece of equipment to its entirety, and also people being able to interact. Um, with that piece of equipment and with people who are using that piece of equipment. So I think in this presentation, we, we were a little vague, you know, we showed some concepts maybe, and the piece, actual pieces of equipment that end up being chosen are, are going to um, kind of be honed in in, in further designs. Um, but, it, you know, there's, it's important to make sure that um, people are able to uh, interact with, with a piece of equipment or an element uh, in a way that makes them feel included in the play. So whether or not you can climb it, can you access it and be interacting with someone who is climbing it? Are there tactile experiences um, and, and just ways that you can feel included? And, you know, that's a little bit more specific um, to each piece of equipment that gets selected down the road. Um, but that's definitely something that we're always looking at um, when we're trying to think of how people are going to interact and how they're going to move about the space, making sure that there's room for everyone to be able to access all of the, the pieces and at least have some level of interaction with it, regardless of how um, much physical exertion or, um, or maybe even um, just getting the courage to climb up something that you, you don't think you're quite ready to yet, um, providing different levels uh, of experience. Yeah, I'll, I'll second um, everything that Nick said. It's, it's always at the forefront of our mind. Um, and also when um, we uh, get further along in the design, um, of these spaces, um, we do um, communicate with a playground manufacturer, and um, they have designers, um, you know, on on their end, and they look over our designs, and we work together, and they um, they know this this very well, and they they specialize in this, and so they can um, look at our design and make sure um, that it is completely inclusive. Great, thank you. Um, so another question we have that's probably for our team is, um, is there a way to have a water feature or a splash pad in this playground? Yeah, I, I can take that. So um, again, you know, we presented on our first meeting about the, the limitations because this is on a landfill. Um, we are looking at putting the restroom in. So we, we do have a water service up here, but um, we believe it would be pretty difficult to get this, uh, you know, a, a water park type of a, of a element permitted on the landfill. Um, it would have to go through a process. And again, Bob, you can probably speak to this. Um, I, I think it would be difficult um, because you'd be dealing with the, the, not only the drainage, but the water lines and um, the potential settlement on the surfacing of a water park. As soon as you get a crack, you'd have water going from that down into the into the sub base and I think it could be be problematic from a permitting perspective. I would agree with you Glenn. I think there are certain things that DEP would maybe not prohibit but would not like to encourage at the site, you know, camping, things like that, water features, they would be things that DEP would discourage. So I would say that it's probably unlikely that a water feature could be incorporated at this site. Great, thank you. Um, so a, a question we have is about how these structure, how these playground structures might affect the birds. Will the, this playground go through any committees like Mass Audubon or a DP or anything to review the effect of this structure on um, the habitat for the birds? Um, you know, this is a really good question. I've never had this question come up. And um, I think, you know, looking at the structures, I know it's hard to tell and we haven't really decided on what's, what equipment's going to be there yet. But 
um, the the ropes are really spread out, and um, I, I haven't ever seen a conflict with a play structure and a bird to date. Um, but I think it's a fair question, being that there's a ton of birds up here, and um, and we want to keep them there, you know. And so it's it's a fair question, and I'm happy to run it by uh, the playground manufacturers, and um, you know, just shoot a quick question to Mass Audubon if they've seen any issues with play structures. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, another comment about the playground slide. So there was a question about, so metal gets too hot. And um, so the only other option would be plastic. Is that true? Or are there another, is there another option other than plastic and metal for playground slides? Yeah, that, so that's a good question. I have not specified something other than plastic or metal. Um, Nick, are you familiar with any anything? No, and we've been we've been doing a, a good amount of research on slides recently. Um, so uh, I can I cannot think of um, a, another surface that's going to give you the slide effect and not be metal or plastic. I do know about the concerns about having a metal slide in an open sun, um, and we certainly wouldn't be proposing that. With that said, depending on, you know, again, the feedback that comes out of this meeting, um, we can look into that once we know the type and size of slides that'll, you know, what features they'll be attached to. We can um, do some research, see what other manufacturers are out there and see what alternative materials are. You know, all these concepts are based on um, the natural environment and wanting to maintain um, and include natural materials. So, um, you know, we'll definitely make a note um, that that would be a desirable thing to include and find out what's available. Yeah, Ben mentioned um, concrete slides and I have, I don't believe we have any in Boston. I'm, I'm sure someone will prove me wrong. Um, I, they have them back where I grew up and they are very slippery. Um, and, but it takes a while for them to get established like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a material that we could use though. Um, maybe on an embankment, we could think about it, but certainly not on attached to a structure. But, um, as Glenn mentioned, you know, we can take a look at if there, there are any other options, but again, um, we do stick with certain manufacturers because we want to make sure that they're tried and true equipment. We don't want to build a playground that falls apart or looks terrible in, you know, short amount of time. Our playgrounds, typically we don't replace them. I mean, with Millennium, we haven't replaced it for 20 years. So we need to make sure that we are using materials that will last for quite a while um, because we don't want to, or we can't come back. Um, to replace them unless you know there's a, a huge issue but we want to make sure they last and we want to make sure that we're spending uh money in a fiscally responsible way perfect thank you um so another question was uh how will you manage each area to ensure younger children don't use older age equipment and i know i can respond to that on my uh on the first concept which is where we use an enclosed fence to enclose the, the two to five year olds in one area. And we use fencing and berms to kind of keep them in that area. Um, for the other designs, I don't know if Nick or Rachel want to speak on those options. Sure. Um, I know there's kind of uh, two trains of thought um, with the separation of, of area of um, age group areas. Um, and if there is a desire to have a fully enclosed two to five area to exclude um, um, kind of intimidation um, from, from older children moving into that area. Um, I think, you know, the, the last slide that Glenn showed, there's, there's options. Uh, and I think any one of these, um, these concepts could have some fencing or separation added to it to to alleviate any of those concerns. Um, I, I know, you know, John went with a more enclosed um, kind of separated areas. Mine's a little bit uh, more fluid. And I think Rachel's is a little bit more fluid as well. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a, a kind of happy medium um, between all of those concepts or a way to integrate um, an enclosed area into any one of these concepts. Yeah, this is one of the primary um, topics that we want to hear from you. Um, so, you know, you in the community as you're hopefully you'll go and, and, and um, fill in the survey that you'll see the connection to at, at the end of this. 
um, we really want to hear that. Um, as Nick said, there's you know a couple trains of thought, but we want to follow your lead. So you know if if 90% of the people that are on this call are saying no, we really we really don't want the tots to be moving back and forth between play areas. We don't want them going near the um, equipment. Our you know our ability to supervise is is you know a little bit limited, and we just don't want to have to. Um, we don't have to want to be dealing with that. So you really need to let us know if you think the opposite that, you know, with just having some natural barriers and, and good places for us to sit while, while our kids are playing. And, uh, you know, we feel like we would be able to supervise enough and we don't think we need, you know, a, a specific fence, at least around the whole thing. Um, we, we want to hear that. So we're really going to follow the lead from the community on that one. Great, thank you. Um, so I've gone through the list and I think I've asked all of the questions. If there are some that are missing, please feel free to speak up. Great, so um, let's move to the, the next step slide. I think it's one more pass. There we go. Um, so Christine was amazing and got our survey up online um, tonight. So you guys can access it. I put it in the chat there um, on our website. It's at the bottom of this slide here. It's boston.gov backslash Millennium Park. You can go to the community online survey there. Tell us more of your thoughts. Please send this out. You guys are such a well-connected community. And um, I, I noticed that people are, you know, pace, posting on Facebook and and um, and Twitter and and kind of getting the word out about this project. So I thank you for that, and please help us get the word out about this survey too. We would love to see a lot of surveys come in to kind of inform our next um, step in the design, which is that preferred design. Um, and then after this meeting, we're gonna take all we're gonna take all this input that we heard tonight, kind of summarize it. Have the um, have the survey open? I believe the survey is open for two weeks, but I will need to confirm that. Um, we'll we'll take we'll gather the thoughts from the survey, and then um, we'll develop that preferred concept plan, and we'll come back to you in April and in May. And again, here, did we get it right? So that's another chance for you to weigh in and to hear your thoughts on that. And the the plan will be a little further developed, um, so we can get into kind of more of the details. So. Um, I thank you all for your time tonight. And um, again, if you have friends that weren't able to make it, please let them know that the meeting was recorded and they can view it at their own convenience. And um, we hope to see you at the next meeting. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.